Whether it's because of fear, arrogance, or just bad writing, horror movie characters are known to make terrible decisions which often lead to themselves or others being brutally killed. Maybe it's just one bad decision, or maybe it's an entire movie's worth of mistakes that lead to their demise. I'm Jordan Kant, and today, we're gonna find out who could have survived Saw. Now, before I start, let's set some ground rules. Rule 1. I will not consider a character's survival based on pure luck or information that they had no way of knowing at the point of their demise. Rule 2. If a character's death was based on the decision of another character, I will still only be considering their survival based on the decisions they themselves could have made to survive. Rule 3. I will only take into account external factors that the character had a level of control over, such as items it would be reasonable to assume that they had access to throughout the movie. Now that that's out the way, let's see how many unfortunate souls could have survived this movie. Directed in 2004 by James Wan in his directorial breakout, Saw opens with Adam Faulkner Stanhite, played by Australian screenwriter Lee Whannell, waking up in a bathtub full of water, and in his panic he makes his first mistake. Now, it's hard to say that it was his fault, as when someone becomes suddenly conscious submerged in water, they would panic, and only be focusing on one thing, which is obviously not drowning. However, in his panic, he knocks the drain plug out, and we watch as a mysterious light goes down the drain pipe, which he will regret later on. To be fair to him, he would have been feeling quite panicked and confused. How are you feeling, Adam? Very fucking confused! No need for the expletives there, Adam, but I can see you're stressed, so we'll let it pass. Once Adam has become more aware of his surroundings, he discovers a dead body with a tape player and another man chained up across the room called Lawrence Gordon, played by Carl Il Ilwiz Il Ilwiz El Elwiz Elsis, who is in many, many movies, none of which I've seen. Yes. Don't come at me, I've not seen The Princess Bride. Moving on. The two characters discuss how they have no idea how they got there, while Adam plays about with the chain on his ankle and checks to see if any of his organs have been taken, but Lawrence assures them that they haven't. But how do you know that, Lawrence? You'd either be in terrible agony, or you'd be dead by now. Trust me. Yeah, but, like, not every doctor would know that. Are you, like, some kind of surgeon? Yeah. Huh. Well, hopefully that'll lead you to make some smart medical decisions later on in the movie. Lawrence makes the reasonable assumption that they are not dead for a reason, and at that point makes the correct decision to look for clues. And after finding several cassette tapes and cleverly using the plug on chain from the bath and tying it to his shirt, Adam hooks the tape recorder from the hand of the dead body and upon listening to the tapes, they discover that someone has been watching them and judging their character and telling Adam that he is going to die unless he does something about it, and telling Lawrence that he has a few hours to kill Adam or his family will die. They are also given some clues to help them survive, the first of which they discover is a very faint voice on the tape saying, follow your heart, at which point they notice a heart drawn onto the toilet next to Adam. I've watched this movie many times, and I distinctly remember the first time watching this film and just thinking, why did he check the toilet bowl when it was so obvious he should have just checked the top first? I really wish I had checked in there first. Huh. Yeah, you shoulda. Anyway, in it, he finds two saws. One of which he breaks very quickly trying to cut his chain, and the other he had already given to Lawrence. Now, with the thickness of the shackled chains on their ankles, it would be near impossible to saw through them with the saws at their disposal. However, it is hard to tell if the metal is rusted enough, but to cut through the presumably hollow pipes that the shackles are attached to would be a much more likely feat to achieve, and is what the two of them should have at least attempted. And after a few slides of the saw, if any visible damage was starting to show, then they could continue, and if there was no further damage, then they should have stopped as to ensure that they don't break the saws and then continue to look for other clues. After giving up with the saws, Lawrence mentions that he thinks he knows why this might be happening, and we're introduced to five new characters. Detectives Tap, played by Danny Glover, Singh, played by Ken Lung, and Carrie, played by Dina Myers. 
as well as two of Jigsaw's victims, Paul and Mark. And finally, we have our first dead character for me to try and save. We find a dead body trapped in a cage full of razor wire, which looks quite fresh, and so the first suggestion would have been for the character to just stay in place until help came. However, as I stated in the rules, factors out of the control of the character in question are not considered in their survival. And as Detective Carey states, This one's not fresh anymore. At least three weeks out. So this brings me on to the tape that states that this man must find the path to escape the cage through the wires before 3 o'clock, which is just under two hours away. He only has his underwear and no other items on him or available to his access. Now, the three main arteries to protect in this situation are the carotid arteries located in the sides of your neck, the brachial arteries found in your inner arms, and the one which carry states caused the majority of the subject's blood loss and then later demise, the femoral arteries mostly situated in the thigh and pelvic regions of our body. Now, the voice on the tape implies that there is a path to escape, and so taking a minute to analyse the situation and look for a path would be sensible, as depending on severity, someone will only stay conscious for, at most, about an hour after severing one of these arteries. And in the case of a severe wound, it would knock them out and kill them in as little as a few minutes. Considering the character has about two hours to escape, then to rush into the situation would likely get him killed way before the door even closes, locking him in. Now, if there is a route which seems semi-manageable, then I would have the character take off his underwear, as having the material stretched across the thighs is going to have next to no effect in protecting the legs and therefore the femoral arteries. And I would use the underwear instead as a sort of protective glove by folding it over as thickly as possible across the front of the hand. This would allow one hand to better move the razor wires without suffering as much pain and damage. This of course wouldn't entirely protect the hand, but it would help allow you to move the wires out of the way of important body parts as you traverse through the wire maze. I would focus on using the other arm to protect the neck and continue to work my way out of the maze. Now, all of this only works if there's a safe enough path to traverse without injuring yourself to the point of bleeding out. If there was no obvious path to take, then I would change my approach. I would again remove the underwear and use it as a slight form of protection. I will lie flat on my front and do a sort of army crawl across the floor, using the underwear as a slight buffer against any wires that will graze the face, head, or arms, as these are the parts that will most likely get cut as they are the furthest front and furthest side parts of the body. As most of the major arteries are located in the front and inner points of the body, they would be protected from the wires assuming that there were no wires stretched across the floor. I would attempt to do the majority of the maze in this position, only standing if I came to an impasse. The third option I have, which has one key condition, is to attempt to pull the wires apart from however they're attached to the walls of the cage, again using the underwear as a protective glove to allow you to grip the wires slightly easier. However, this fully depends on how the wires are attached to the cage, and as we don't get a good look, and from how Paul's body is hanging from the wires, it is safe to assume that it would take a fair amount of force to detach the wires from the cage. To summarize, I believe that there are three possible ways in which someone could escape the trap, and knowing the premise of the film, I believe that option one is the only definite way to escape the trap, with options two and three requiring a certain degree of luck and bad design on the part of the killer which isn't enough to justify using them as definite ways to escape. Bottom line is, that do I think with the escape plan I've thought of, someone could escape the trap? Yes, I do. I think that if someone was thin and quite flexible and dexterous, they would stand a chance. Unfortunately for Paul, I don't believe with absolute certainty that someone of his build and athleticism would confidently be able to escape the trap. And therefore, Paul could not have survived. Quickly after the description of Paul's experience, we are treated to a second failed attempt to survive one of the games our detectives are investigating. We meet a man called Mark, who has a very simple but extremely difficult game in which he has to find the codes to a safe 
which contains the antidote to a slow-acting poison which is currently inside him. The catch is that there are numbers written all over the walls, broken glass all over the floor, and he is covered in a flammable substance with a candle being his main light source for the dark areas of the room. He investigates the room before eventually mishandling the candle and lighting himself on fire, which is the cause of his death. Now, I have a few ideas for this one, but none that I think could lead to certain success since we don't know how long Mark has before the poison overwhelms him, and similarly, the candle only has a small amount of wax and so it will eventually burn completely, causing it to be very difficult to see in the dark. The glass, although painful to step on, is no danger to Mark's life and so isn't something to be worried about in terms of survival, and I should know that myself as I have walked on glass before. Not fun. I did consider that if used effectively, the glass could be used to scrape off the majority of the flammable substance on the victim's body. This, however, would take a lot of time and considering we don't know how long we have and that it would be impossible to safely assume that you were no longer flammable, I believe that it would be more hassle than just trying to safely use the candle. My next idea was to look for clues as to which numbers could be the code for the safe but this would require there to be clues hidden around the room. And if there were none, and this is in fact a game of chance, then that would also be a waste of time and you could end up dying from the poison. And so my final solution is to just enter all of the possible codes and hope to get lucky. I would start with the darker areas so that you can use the candle before it burns out. And then if you're still alive once it does, I would start trying all the other codes that you can see while standing by the safe as to be able to go through all the options as quickly as possible. If you're lucky, the safe will open, and you will have the antidote, but chances are that you will die from the poison before you ever find the code. For this trap, I believe that without the existence of hidden clues that neither Mark or the audience were informed of, and without some incredible blind luck of just randomly selecting the code to open the safe, Mark could not have survived. Right, back to some plot now as the three detectives talk about a killer who is being known as Jigsaw, and Detective Carey mentions that they have found a pen light which they send away to get fingerprints. We then have a flashback to Dr. Lawrence teaching a group of young doctors about a man who has a tumour which has developed from colon cancer, when another man stops to tell the doctor, His name is John. Dr. Gordon before the doctor is called to an office to speak to Detective Singh and Tap. They have found that the fingerprints on the pen were Lawrence's, but he has an alibi, and so in an attempt to have Lawrence work out who is trying to set him up for murder, he is asked to sit through Survivor Amanda's testimony. Amanda is one of my favourite characters in this series. I can't really say why, uh, but fun fact about actor Shawnee Smith, um, she is half of the country rock duo, Smith and Pyle, with the other half being Missy Pyle, who I know and love from Galaxy Quest or Charlie and the Cho Chocolate Factory. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And so, I don't have, anyway. <laughs> Amanda's testimony brings us nicely to our next trap. And from the fact that we know she is a survivor, we know she successfully escapes the trap. However, in her escape, she does kill another person. But was there a way in which she could have escaped the trap without having to kill the other person? She wakes up in a mechanism on her head, described as the reverse bear trap, which once activated will count down from 60 before opening and ripping her face open from the mouth. The key to unlocking it is said to be in the stomach of her dead cellmate. The other person was described to be dead already and so to Amanda's knowledge he was dead, until she had already made her fatal mistake. But we later find out that he was in fact under the influence of an opiate overdose which has caused him to lose control of his muscles and therefore cannot move or fight back. He can however make a small amount of noise which we see when he awakens moments before she kills him. An opiate overdose can be fatal but it's likely that if the person experiencing the overdose has regained consciousness then they are going to survive as they have likely made it through the worst part. A person can survive a few days without water, and Amanda only triggers the trap by releasing the wire attached to the back of it by moving away. 
This means that the only way both people could have survived this trap is if Amanda had stopped and took in her situation and realized that there was a release cord that would have activated her trap. In the meantime, the cellmate could have regained consciousness and would likely instinctively start to make as much noise as he could muster given his situation. In the silence of the room, Amanda would likely have heard this and have been able to make some noise back. Eventually, the opiates would have worn off and would have given the cellmate the ability to move enough to find Amanda. Assuming that they have made it this far, their next big problem would occur due to Amanda being unable to speak. Although difficult, it wouldn't be impossible for Amanda to signal to her cellmate that there was a lock, and assuming he eventually asked the correct questions, she would be able to indicate that the key was in his stomach. Due to the lack of oxidization occurring on the metal key in his stomach, the cellmate at that point should be able to induce vomiting, which would likely not at all be difficult as it is often a side effect of an opiate overdose, and be able to obtain the key, then unlocking Amanda without her ever having to move out of the chair. Now, all of this is rather far-fetched, but considering the cellmate awakens only a few minutes after Amanda, it's not much of a stretch to assume that if she had assessed her situation, she would have taken enough time for him to have woken up. Is this situation likely, given the panic and fear which is the stem of most of Amanda's thought process? No. But it is definitely a possibility that they could have both survived, and so, Amanda and the cellmate could have survived. Amanda finishes explaining what happened, and when asked if she thought it was good for her, she says, He helped me. Ooh, I'm seeing a little bit of crazy there with you, Mandy, but nah, I'm, I'm sure you're chill. Back to the shackled duo, and after hearing Lawrence's story, Adam has an outburst where he threatens to hurt Lawrence with a shard broken from the mirror that Adam hit earlier with his saw. Upon realizing that the mirror seems to be one way, Adam throws more stuff at the mirror, shattering it and revealing a hidden camera, which leads to more outbursts of anger from Adam as Lawrence reminds us again that he is a doctor by saying something about diseases. To overcome something, you have to understand what a perfect engine it is. It's how you fight disease. And decides only now to think about another clue mentioned in the tapes. I mean, it's only been about 100 minutes since they woke up in that room, you know. We cut to a young girl asleep in her bed who randomly wakes up in the night and is braver than I ever was walking into the darkness of her room thinking there was a bad man in there. She goes and gets her sleeping mother who then gets her father who turns out to be Lawrence, who after finishing his work, he tells his daughter that he will keep her safe. This flashback seemed to take another hour in which Adam and Lawrence seemingly did nothing before Lawrence decides to have a heart to heart with Adam about his daughter. He then throws his wallet to Adam in which Adam finds another clue unknown to Lawrence. About four minutes of the movie has gone by since Lawrence told his daughter he would always keep her safe before her and his wife are attacked by a man who ties them to a bed. I have to say that I am very impressed with young Mackenzie Vega's performance in this scene, as she is very effectively portraying great distress and fear at the age of 10 years old. It also shocked me when I realized that she is older than me, at 26. We discovered that this guy who was terrorizing the Lawrence family was the same weird guy who reminded him of his patient's name in the hospital, Zepp Hindle played by Mark Emerson. We get an odd montage of everything we've seen over the last 40 minutes, and then get a strange conversation between Lawrence and Detective Tap that, personally, I don't understand the relevance of, but if anyone else does, then let me know. Tap is now back at the office, and we get to see the lovely workplace dynamic that Tap and Singh have. I, I don't mean for this to be disrespectful. Maybe you should find yourself a girlfriend. <laughs> it's in the stomach of your death. Before Tap discovers another clue leading them to an old mannequin factory where they head to, without a warrant, to investigate further. And that is where we will end this video here. Thank you so much for watching. This is insane. I've been wanting to make this series for literally years now, but with college and with work and just life, 
I've just never really gotten around to it. And here I am, finally. Uh, I suppose being in lockdown has given me one good thing. Apart from this new shiny hair, please compliment it, don't insult it, I will cry. Um, yeah, I have the time and just really wanted to get it, get it done. And I've had so much fun making this video. I have written the whole of the first film and the second film script, so every video after this has slightly more of a layout, as I'm still getting used to it, but it's going to constantly evolve. And thank you so much for watching! So if you like what you saw, please leave a like, and if you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button. I have another series in which I just show you what I do on a weekly basis in a vlog with me and my friends, so much more lighthearted than this. And if you agree or disagree with any of my opinions, let me know in the comments. Maybe you have your own ideas of how characters could have survived, or maybe I got some medical science wrong. I'm not a doctor, I just do some googling. So, thank you for watching, and see you next time on Who Could Have Survived? Saw.